Inventions have a way of spawning other inventions. During the war, I was given gas coupons and a waiver to fly my own airplane wherever the job required. But once on the ground, I needed wheels. And even taxis were limited in gas allotment. I don't know how many times I spent hours walking miles or waiting for lifts. I took to kicking the tires of my airplane, asking why it couldn't take me down the highway. After all, doesn't an airplane have all the components of an automobile? Both have wheels, an engine, controls, and seats. Then why can't the airplane travel down the highway? Obviously, the wings and the tail are too big, and the propeller is dangerous. That's simple. Just leave them behind. And so, magic presto, the amphibious ideal. And the four-wheeled amphibian. In less than five minutes, one person could convert it from one mode to the other. All the tools were built in, and the engine starter wouldn't work unless the job was done correctly. I was often asked if the wings could be taken off in the air. Of course they could. But if that's what you wanted to do, it would be much easier just to open the door and jump out. There were times when I guess some people thought I had. I remember landing at an Air Force base one day converting from air to road operations and trying to drive off the base. When the military guard at the gate asked for my identification, I showed him my driver's license. I mean for your vehicle. Where's the card they gave you when you drove in? I explained that I didn't drive in, I flew in. You what, he said? Everybody else drives through this gate. And now you're gonna sit there and tell me you flew right over it? Well, you're gonna have to tell that to the colonel. An hour later, I finally got out. But my major problems were at a different sort of gate. No aircraft can be sold in the United States unless its design is approved by the government. The requirements for approval of normal airplanes were bad enough, but when it came to flying automobiles, the book had not yet been written, and the resulting certification expenses became exorbitant. During four years, I built and operated eight amphibians thousands of flying hours and road miles from coast to coast. I sometimes think the paperwork end to end would stretch that same distance. In order to finish the test program, I was obliged to sell control of the company. And by the time the certificate of approval was obtained, the first one ever issued by any government for a flying automobile, other people were dictating the company's policy, which I found so unacceptable that I bowed out. The only remaining amphibian is in the Smithsonian Aerospace Museum in Washington. I'm sorry I can't take you for a ride, Whitman, but in some of those pictures you saw the amphibian and your father when he was about your age. The sad end of it all reminded me of my mother, who when things were difficult, would point out that kites rise against the wind. There certainly was plenty of wind. I was broke and disheartened. But if I could keep my kite string from breaking, something good might still come of it. I'd learned a lot more about aviation.